Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, it is great for everyone to be here. Hope everybody got enough to eat. If you didn't, it was your own fault because I saw some extra food leaving out. So there was plenty and it was good. It was very good. So go ahead and mark on your calendar for that last Sunday of next month and we'll plan on doing this again. Just a quick update on the prayer list. Um, the Christians in Ukraine, we mentioned that. And I don't think we've mentioned that too many times. There's war going on over there and... Uh, those Christians, we certainly need to pray for them. And, and in Russia too, because uh, it's kind of illegal to be a Christian in Russia. So they got, got to be under the radar. Uh, Sylvia Edwards, keep her in your prayers. Donnie McClure, Edna Sharp, as she recovers from her surgery. Uh, she had maybe maybe a little bit of blood pressure issues, but uh, but doing pretty well besides that. So continue to remember her. And Lloyd Wright said Robbie Robertson was going to be home on Tuesday. So keep him in your prayers. Ken McCurry's knee surgery is scheduled for March 2nd, and David Payton is scheduled to have surgery on March 10th. We also want to remember Levi Abbott and Kevin Britton in their prayers as well. Also, don't forget our Tuesday morning Bible class. That'll be here at the building at 10 a.m., so please plan to be here if you can be out at Tuesday morning at 10. Also, men's breakfast, uh, March 5th at 8 a.m. here at the building. I encourage all the men to come for that as well. There are sign-up sheets for, for attending and also sign-up sheets for speaking back there. I also want to encourage everyone to be thinking about our Vacation Bible School. It's scheduled for June 5th through the 8th. Uh, we'll have our next meeting on March 20th, so please plan on being there, and our theme is going to be Courage this year. Also, as a reminder, our young men will lead worship Sunday evening on March 6th, and we'll have our door knocking at 10 a.m. here at the building uh, on March 12th. We'll leave from there. That's all the announcements I have at this time. At the proper time, uh, Brian Petty John will lead us in our opening prayer, and Gary Murray will lead us in our closing prayer. That being said, we'll begin our song service. And our first song for tonight is number 867, Humble Yourselves. <clears throat> Let us sing. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Thank you for this day and the many blessings you bestow upon us. Heavenly Father, bless the sick and the afflicted according to thy will. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of Brother Ken McCurry that's going to have surgery and Brother David Payton. 
be with them, be with the doctors and nurses as they take care of them. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our shortcomings, forgive us of our sins, and forgive those that sin against us. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of the brethren in Ukraine and Russia who suffered at this time. Be with the world leaders that peace may abound. Be with our President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin that they might end this peacefully. Heavenly Father, be with us, Brother David, as he presents the questions and answers tonight. And be with Brother Jesse as he made us and does a fine job leading singing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for that prayer, Brian. We sure do appreciate you. The song after the lesson tonight, if anyone's following along, the book will be number 772. Number 772. And before the lesson today, we will sing number 776, the first and last verses of 776. If you don't mind, please stand as we sing. <clears throat> will your anchor hold? <clears throat> Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of sky? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain? Will your anchor drift or burn remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul great to be here and as always so great to see everyone out couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks at the Lafayette Church of Christ and if you are as full as I am you are going to have trouble staying awake I'm telling you it reminds me of the story where this visiting preacher came in and they told him they said now Uncle Versi is going to go to sleep Every time, it does not matter how energetic you are, how good the message is, he's going to go to sleep. And that preacher said, well, that's not going to happen. And so sure enough, about halfway through the sermon, he went to sleep. And the preacher said, now, everybody who wants to go to heaven, stand up. Everybody stood up but Uncle Verson. And he said, now... Everybody wants to go to hell, stand up. Uncle Versi stood up and said, uh, Preacher, I don't know what we're voting on, but only you and me is for it. And so, maybe we can stay away. This is questions and answers. There are three questions that we want to take the time to look at uh, this afternoon uh, in our study. And uh, we again, we want to appeal to the Scriptures. The Bible says, come and let us reason together. And that's our goal, to go to the Bible and do our very best and giving the best possible logical answer to these questions. Remember that I'm not the authority. Uh, God is, His Word is. 
if there is a question that we discuss or, or one that I answer and, and you'd like to talk more about it, feel free to come to me. We can talk about it uh, and, and we can come to a good conclusion. This very first question is, please explain Luke chapter 3 and verse 8. What did John mean when he told the people to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance? Let's go, if you will, to the book of Luke, the third chapter in verse 8. And look at this passage together and see if we can come to a conclusion. Now, keep in mind that when you look at this, let's try to keep it in the context. You really got to start all the way back into verse 1. We're not going to do that. We know that John has come. We know that he's preaching. But let's look at verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. That's a very pointed, blatant statement, isn't it? And, and here John is telling these people, or this group of people, that they are to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. The very first thing that I want to ask myself is, is what is repentance that he's talking about right here in the context of the Scripture? When you look up the word repentance, whether it's here or in any other context in the New Testament, it's literally referring to a radical change that one makes in his life. In fact, if, if you will, let's flip over to the book of 2 Corinthians. We looked at this chapter, if you remember last week. Hold your hand right there because we're going to come back to it. If you go over to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, there the Apostle Paul is discussing repentance. And, and, and note, if you will, in, in verse 10 of chapter 7, the Bible says godly sorrow produces repentance. So what do we learn about repentance. Repentance comes when an individual experiences godly sorrow. Now, what is godly sorrow? Let's begin with the word sorrow. The word sorrow is a word that we are well acquainted with. We might think of the word grief when we experience some kind of loss in our life. Maybe it's the loss of a job. It's the loss of a relationship. It's the loss of life. We experience what is called grief. Okay. Take that idea and put it with the word godly. Godly sorrow is when we recognize that we have wronged God or we have wronged His people or we have wronged the church. We have wronged His Word and we are grieving over it. We are sorry that we did that. And when we have that kind of sorrow, the Bible says that it leads to Repentance, if you'll note there in the context, godly sorrow, look at what it does. It produces repentance. But godly sorrow doesn't just produce repentance. Look at the things that he talks about beginning in verse 11. Diligence, it produced. Clearing, indignation, zeal, vindication. And that very last thing that he speaks of there in verse 11 the word clear. Note that word clear, if you will, literally means innocence. I want to suggest to you that what Paul is doing here in verse 11 is he is talking about what John was talking about, fruits of repentance. In the context of the scripture, what has happened? These people had wronged Paul. And what had they done? They had recognized it. What caused them to do that? It was godly sorrow, and that godly sorrow caused them to change the lives that they live. Now, when we go back to our context, we need to ask ourselves, who is John talking to? If you look at Luke's account in verse 7, it says the multitudes came out to be baptized of him. And it seems as if he is calling this entire multitude a brood of vipers. Let's go to a parallel passage and see if we can see exactly who John was talking to when he referred to them as a brood of vipers. Let's go to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 3. Go to Matthew chapter 3. 
And let's look at what Matthew had to say. Okay? In Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, I want you to see that we're this is a parallel passage, still talking about the same thing. Verse 1, look at what it says of Matthew 3. In those days, who came preaching? Who was it? John the Baptist. This is the same passage. Matthew is just giving a different flavor to it. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What was his message? To repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The only difference between Matthew's message and Luke's message is Luke makes mention that he is preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. In both of the messages, it points out clearly that John was telling them to repent. What does it mean to repent? Once again, it refers to a radical change in one's life. One of the greatest or one of my favorite definitions given to the word repent, and it's not one that was coined by me, it's one that I heard many years ago and it stuck with me. Repentance is a change of mind brought about by godly sorrow which results in a change of life. Now, can you see that in the teaching of the Bible? Yes, over and over and over again. You've got the illustration. You, you're going to see this in our minor prophets when we get to the book of Jonah. You remember what God had determined? You go to Nineveh and you tell them 40 days and God's going to do what? He's going to destroy it. That, that was the message that Jonah preached. What did the people of Nineveh do? What did they do? They repented. Okay? What does that mean? They changed their lives. They changed their actions. You see, there is a great example of repentance. Look, look at the life of the Apostle Paul. And remember the idea or definition of repentance. A change of mind brought about by godless all results in a change of life. What kind of a person was Paul before he became Paul? Oh, he was wicked, evil, persecuted people just like you and me. The Bible describes him or he describes himself as an insolent man in the book of 1 Timothy. And that word insolent literally means wicked and evil. He was a very wicked, evil, violent man. But when he was obedient to the gospel, what did he do? He repented. What caused him to do that? Godly sorrow. What did it result in? A change of life. And so what is John beseeching them or encouraging them to do? To repent. Now, who is he specifically speaking to when he tells them to bring forth fruits? Drop down, if you're in Matthew's account, to verse 5. The Bible says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in Jordan. Don't miss that next phrase. What does it say? What were they doing? They were confessing their sins. Now folks, the only way you're going to confess your sins is if you have what? If you've repented. And so you can see that these people are coming out to John. They're not just coming to be baptized. It's not just the fact that, well, there's a great speaker down there and he's preaching about baptism. Let's go down and be baptized with him. No, they are confessing their sins they are in essence bringing forth fruits of repentance. They're showing John and the people around them that we are willing to change our lives. Okay, Now, in the very next verse, but when he saw many of the who? Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Who was John speaking to when he made that statement? He was speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Why did he call them a brood of vipers? Why did he tell them to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance? He knew that they were just coming simply to either see the baptism or to be baptized just to go along with the crowd. And what did John say? You bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. How can you tell within the context of the Scripture that they were unwilling to repent? Look at the very next verse. 
And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Do you remember when Jesus was trying to convince the people that He was the Son of God? And they said, we are children of Abraham. What was the point that they were trying to make? We're not changing anything about us. We've been following Abraham all of these years. We're going to keep on following Abraham. And that was the attitude of these people. And if you'll continue to read, look at what he said in verse 10. For even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. Brothers and sisters, that's a judgment passage. And the point that he is making is that we do, if we do not bear fruit in the lives that we are living, then what's going to happen in the final judgment? We will be cut down and we will be thrown into the fire. The phrase fruits worthy of repentance is just simply a phrase showing that you and I have to show in our lives by the change that we have made that we are different people. When you talk about being obedient to the gospel, folks, so many times we emphasize baptism, baptism, baptism. And, and baptism is important. It is. In fact, it's the only way that you can get into Christ Jesus. It's the only way that you can contact the blood. But if you are unwilling to repent, if an individual is an adulterer, or maybe a fornicator, or, or, or maybe this individual has some other kind of worldly sin in their life, and they are baptized into Christ. Repentance requires them to do what? Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. They have to change the way they live. If I was an alcoholic, if I was a gambler, whatever I may have been, the Bible teaches me in Christ, I am a new creation. Brand new. God has forgiven me of everything. But I have to be willing to change the life that I live. <clears throat> this next question, is it right for a woman to serve in the position of a minister? If so, where is the scripture for it? We live in a world today where things are constantly changing. I'm certain that probably most of you have heard of the Clear Creek Church of Christ in Hickson they have just introduced mechanical instruments of music into worship. And folks, may I suggest to you that that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just one area that they have introduced, and as time goes on, you can watch a further departure from the truth. When one starts down the road of departure, many times there is no coming back. Likewise, it's not just instrumental music. There is a big push within the church today to put women in leadership positions, to make them elders within the church, to give them, them the permission and uh, the position to stand up here and, and preach and teach where men are present. Not just that, but to serve on the Lord's table and to lead in prayers. And, and what we have to do is we have to go to the Bible and ask ourselves, the plain Bible question, what does God's Word say about leadership when it comes to worship? I want you to go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians, and there we want to note chapter 11. Now, when I think about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, or I think about the book of Corinthians period, the first book of Corinthians, Paul is writing to a very troubled church. Remember in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is just overjoyed. Why? Because the church at Corinth had repented of many of the things that he wrote to them in the book of 1 Corinthians. In the book of 1 Corinthians, it seems as if Paul is addressing a different issue in almost every single chapter. I mean, you name it. Chapter 1, there's division. Uh, you come to chapter 2 and the, the fact that they're not growing. You come to chapter 5, a man has taken his father's wife. On and on you go. And in chapter 11, Paul is discussing some disorders that are taking place in worship. Worship was never designed to confuse. But rather, worship is designed by God to build us up, to encourage us. I, I think that maybe that's why Paul would say, 
if you uh, continue on in this passage of Scripture, or, or when we get over into chapter 14, that God is not the author of confusion. And, and so when you think of worship, it was designed to build us up. Now, I want you to drop down to verse 17 and look at what Paul says right here. He says, Now in giving these instructions, so what's Paul doing? He's giving instructions, right? In what realm or in what area? I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together as a church, that phrase come together that is used in verse 17 and in verse 18 is talking about the public worship assembly. When they come together and specifically as he says right here in verse 18, as a what? As a church. And so Paul is discussing the worship assembly. With that thought in mind, back up into verse 3 and look at what he says. But I want you to know that the head of every man is who? It's Christ. The head of woman is who? It's man. And the head of Christ is God. Okay. The word head in this passage of Scripture is a representation of authority. When it comes to the Lord's church, when it comes to the family, who is, according to the Bible, designed to be the head of the family? It is the man. It is the husband. Folks, I did not design that. God did. And it's my job to follow it. When it comes to the church, when it comes to the public assembly, who is to be the head? The Bible plainly teaches us that the man is to be the head. Now go over to chapter 14 of the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. And I want you to know that Paul, again in this chapter, is talking about the worship assembly. Look at verse 23 of chapter 14. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place. What is that talking about? It's talking about the worship assembly. Again, verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you, whenever you come together. Again, keep in mind, from those two phrases, he is talking about the public worship assembly. And look at what he says when you drop down into verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Look at what he says. Let not your, or let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Understand the context of what Paul is talking about. He's talking about in the worship assembly, just like what we are participating in today. It is God's plan that the man be the leader. A lot of people will appeal to this passage and say, well, you know, this was just a cultural problem. I don't believe that for a second based upon verse 33. Look at what it says. As in all the churches of the saints. What congregation did this biblical principle apply to? All of them. Every single one. All the churches of the saints. Has this biblical principle changed? Our culture has changed. Society has changed, but folks, it does not change the plain teaching of God's Word. Go with me, if you will, to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's go to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, I want you to note what Paul writes to Timothy. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself. Where? In the house of God. Now watch Paul identify what he's talking about. Which is the church of the living God and the pillar and the ground of truth. Why is Paul writing to Timothy? To tell him that there is a proper way that they are to conduct themselves when they come together as God's people in worship. All right, what was that proper conduct? Back over into chapter 2 and look at verse 11. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach 
or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. I want you to look at that phrase, to have authority over. It literally refers to assuming a stance of independence, authority uh, to give orders or to dictate. That's what that phrase means. And if a woman was in this position, the preaching position, the teaching position, or any other position over a man, then the Bible teaches us that she would be in violation of this principle. That's why Paul would say back up into verse 8, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere. Now, is Paul saying that only men can pray in this passage? No. If you keep it within the context, what's he talking about? He's talking within the confines of the worship assembly. Within the confines of the worship assembly, the men are demanded by God or required by God to lead prayer. When it comes to the private setting at home or wherever she may be, of course she has the right to pray and she's encouraged to pray. But in this passage of Scripture, again, Paul is talking about a worship assembly or a worship setting. And he says that she is not permitted to teach or she is not permitted to have authority. Folks, that is very plain. I don't understand how someone can read that passage of Scripture and come to a different conclusion other than what God has said unless it's just exactly what people want. And that's what change is all about in our world today. Change is always about the selfishness of the people. It's what the people want instead of what God wants. Look, I, when I come together to worship, I want to make sure that I'm giving God exactly what He wants, not what I want. Worship is not about you and me. Worship is about the God of heaven. Now, does this idea or does this teaching belittle women? Absolutely not. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, there is neither male or female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. She is just as important in the eyes of God as is any man. Just because she cannot stand in a leadership position before the congregation does not belittle her or suggest in any way, form, or fashion that she is not important. Does this mean that she cannot teach perhaps children? Absolutely not. Where in the world will we be without good Christian women teaching our children? In fact, think about Timothy for just a moment. If you remember Timothy over in the book of 2 Timothy, and in verse, uh, let's say, chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, and in verse 15, Paul told Timothy, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, now how long had he known the Scriptures? From a child. Who taught him? Well, back up into chapter 1 of the book of 2 Timothy. And look at verse uh, verse 5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, where did it come from, Paul? Which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in you also. I'm going to suggest based upon this scripture that the way that Timothy got his faith, his belief, his understanding is because he had a Christian grandmother and he had a Christian mother and they were continually teaching him over and over and over again. I stand before you today with the conviction that I have because of what my good mother put in me. Believe you me. And without her, I couldn't be who I am today. I mean, she started the path that I'm on. And up until the day that she began to lose her mind, she still encouraged me. She still strengthened me. She still taught me. And so to say that a woman is not important because she can't fill that leadership position, that is not the teaching of the Bible. It does not mean that she cannot speak at a lady's day. I mean, it's perfectly biblical to have a lady's day. Why? Well, there ain't no men here. It's all women. And therefore, somebody's got to get up and speak. Somebody's got to lead the singing. Somebody's got to lead the prayers. It's just in the position where men are present. The Bible teaches that she does not have the biblical authority to speak or teach. All right, what does the Bible say about Jesus coming to this earth 
as a man. I thought about being a smart aleck when I read this and just say he did, but that would be wrong and that would discourage you from putting questions in the box. But let's go, if you will, to the book of John chapter 1. I think this is a very good question, a very interesting question, one that we need to know how to answer. And we're going to go to the book of John, the gospel account, if I can never get over there. John chapter 1, and uh, we are going to begin looking at verse 1. Look at what it says, John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, in this context of Scripture, what have you seen thus far? In the beginning, you've got the Word, okay? And, and the Bible identifies the Word as, as who? As God. And not only that, but it says that, that the Word was with God. So you, you've got two beings being referred to in this passage of Scripture. You, you've got God the Father, and you've got God the Son. How do we know that the Word in the context of the Scripture is talking about Jesus? Well, we drop down to verse 14, and you can see it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who was the only begotten of the Father? Well, it was Jesus Christ. And don't miss that next phrase. He was full of grace and truth. All right? Now, drop down to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but watch it, grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. And so the text identifies right here who the Word was, it was none other than Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that He was and still is today God. In fact, if we go back to verse 2, we note that the Bible says that He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. When you think about the creation of the world, according to that passage, who had a hand in it? Jesus Christ. If we were to go to the book of Colossians chapter 1 in verse 16, we would learn again that all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's talking about Jesus Christ. How is it that He could create this world? Because the Bible says that He was God or He was deity. Now, go back if you will to verse 14 of the book of John chapter 1. And the Bible says that He became what? He became flesh. That is an indication that He became a man. How do we know that? Go over to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Go to the book of Philippians with me. And there we want to look at chapter 2. And we want to begin reading in verse 5. Philippians 2 and verse 5. Where Paul would write and say, let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. So who are we talking about right here in this passage? We're talking about Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What does that say about Jesus in, in this passage? When it comes to equality, was the Father above the Son? Or does that verse plainly say, that they were equal. That means the Father was deity, still is. Jesus was deity, still is. 100% God, 100% God, both of them. But look at verse 7. But He made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What do we learn about Jesus there? That He became a man. A man to the point to where He could experience what? Death. He was 100% man, though He was 100% God. Now look at another passage of Scripture that would just kind of nail the coffin shut. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2 that points out the humanity of Jesus. One of the things that the Hebrew writer does 
is he strives to stress to the people the hum human side of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, to be able to let us know that we have someone who understands our problems in life. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, and I want you to begin reading with me in verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. Now who are the children? That's you and me. What does our body consist of? Flesh and blood. Every person in this room, you consist of flesh and blood. Don't miss that. He himself, speaking of Jesus, likewise shared in the same. What does that say about Jesus? If, if you and I had met him, what did he consist of? Flesh and blood. In fact, the only way he could die physically, or the side of Jesus could die, is if he was what? Flesh and blood. So he, the Bible says he shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Now who is the seed of Abraham? You are. We are all the seed of Abraham, brothers and sisters. And who is it that Jesus gives aid to? The seed of Abraham. Verse 17, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren. Now here's the reason why. Why is it that Jesus had to become flesh and blood? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Why is it that Jesus had to become a man? The Bible says so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. What was the purpose? What was the job of the high priest during Old Testament time? What did he do for the people? He offered sacrifices for their what? For their sin. Jesus had to become a man so that he could be our high priest. And note if you will, make propitiation for the sins of the people. The word propitiation just literally means a atonement, a satisfying sacrifice. And so Jesus became the high priest so that he could be a satisfying sacrifice for you and for me. But what was the difference in the sacrifice that Jesus offered and the sacrifice those Old Testament priests offered? Those Old Testament priests offered animals, didn't they? What did Jesus offer? He offered his life. In fact, go with me, if you will, to the book of 1 John chapter 2. Go to the book of 1 John, not the gospel account, but 1 John chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1, I want you to know what the Bible says. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Watch verse 2. And he, him, Self is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's not an animal sacrifice that appeased our sins. It was He Himself, the perfect individual. You see, in that fleshly body, Jesus did something that no one had ever done before. What kind of a life did he live? Perfect. Perfect in the sense that he was sinless. Do you remember the sacrifice that they had to give in order to, I suppose you could say, roll their sins forward? Could they go out in the backyard and say, honey, let's get that sheep with, with one leg and, and the one that is sick and is about to die? Which one did they have to give? They had to give the very best. They had to give a young one, very best, signifying or representing innocence or perfection. Jesus lived His life perfect. And when He gave His life, if you note in the book of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, there the writer would say, for 
God made him to become sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was and still is God, but he took upon himself flesh. He became a man and lived a perfect life so that he could serve as a propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but as John would say, for the sins of the entire world. Now, I know that this is mostly uh, just a general message wherein we just come in and answer questions, but as always, we want to offer the invitation. There may be someone here this evening or this afternoon who has never been obedient to the gospel of Christ. We want to encourage you to do just exactly that. Come believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ, the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of sins. And you leave here this afternoon one of God's children. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God. Your, your life is not right. There are some things that you know you need to correct. And, and whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and as we sing? <laughs> Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in His safety back home. Why not, why not, why not come to Him now? Why not, why not, why not come to Him now? Thank everyone again for being here this afternoon. We're so thankful uh, for your presence. We hope that you will join us again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock and then be back next Sunday for 10 o'clock Bible class and 11 o'clock worship and back to our normal 5 p.m. worship next Sunday evening. If there's anyone here that still needs to partake of the Lord's Supper after the closing prayer, if you will uh, exit the auditorium and make your way down the hall to the left to the Last door on the right, there'll be someone there to serve you. I'm going to sing the first and third verses of number 824. I'll fly away and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. <laughs> Just a